Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you guys again for just allowing me to come up and, you know, kind of talk about maps and stuff for a little while. Uh, it, you know, just kind of following the conference along on, uh, on social media and everything, it seems like you guys have a really interesting group of um, practitioners that have come together and are really solving really interesting problems in the science space. And as someone who's married a geologist myself, uh, I can kind of relate to some of those problems at least, at least secondhand. Uh, so hopefully we can kind of go through and, uh, and figure out some of the things that um, have been kind of plaguing you with that. Uh, so during the introductions, um, it sounded like uh, a lot of people, maybe about half the room, were sort of familiar with Drupal, but not really. Um, is that fairly accurate? Cool. So why don't we, why don't we start by doing the uh, elevator pitch for Drupal, um, because that's, that's a good place to start. So Drupal is a content management, you can call it a system or a framework, um, that is really good at um, creating and managing information that has lots of extra metadata associated with it. And so in Drupal, we consider those things nodes. Um, and a node is like the main source of content on a site, uh, on, on your particular site. And on each node, you can have uh, fields. And so fields are basically the metadata that's associated with that. So um, one of the really cool things about Drupal is that there is a very, very large community of uh, people that have created third-party uh, modules that you can let you do all kinds of interesting stuff with that data. So we have a um, like we have a visual query language model or module called Views, which is like amazing because like writing SQL you know requires you to really be a developer. But if you have something um, like Views, you can you know ask questions to Drupal like show me all the pieces of content on the site um, that are tagged this particular piece of information. Uh, that were posted on a Tuesday um, that have Star Trek associated with it, you know, something like that. Uh, there's uh, a lot of modules for tying into lots of different third-party systems. Um, if you want to kind of put it in the realm of what other systems are, are like, um, it's more complicated than WordPress. It's less complicated than like a pure framework like a Django or a, uh, what's another good framework? Uh, so Symfony uh, is or cake PHP or something like that. Um, so it, it's, it, it sits in this kind of sweet spot where it's really easy to get a site up and running that doesn't require a lot of code. Um, that nor in m many, many other systems, you would probably have to code something together to get that kind of information. I mean, Drupal core by itself, you can create you know, various pieces of content that have you know, dates, locations, um, various types of tagging and taxonomy and you know create all kinds of diff interesting um, views and listings of it and you know you don't have to touch a bit of code and that's that's actually really really cool um, just you know in, uh, from that standpoint um, so I mean that's kind of a high level on Drupal and then outside of that um, so what we're here to talk about is uh, mapping and data viz um, so when we're working through that um, what I'm going to talk about today are, is one of the many stacks of modules that you can use in Drupal uh, to do mapping with, within it. Uh, I'm going to talk about some tools um, that kind of address some of the shortcomings or shortcomings, some of the um, blind spots in Drupal uh, for doing mapping work and that kind of thing. Kind of, kind of run through a list of a few different types of toolings and things like that. Uh, and then we're going to come back and kind of talk a little bit about uh, what would it take to uh, expand Drupal to be a little bit more flexible with especially the kinds of data sets that you're probably working with from on a day-to-day -day basis as you know, scientific uh, practitioners and IT uh, support on that. Uh, so yeah. Uh, this is the Drupal mapping stack that I think works really well. Uh, so this is a set of modules. So modules, again, are just you know, uh, sets of code that extend the functionality of Drupal. Uh, GeoField and GeoPHP is the data storage module for that. Um, I'm pretty partial to that because I've been maintaining it for about two and a half years now. Uh, it's uh, very, very flexible. It allows you to store 
um, you know, points, lines, and polygons. So pretty much anything that you would see in a shape file, you can you you have access to that. Um, it's um, it's pretty bare bones on its own, um, but has a lot of good uh, connections to other Drupal modules that. Um, that can take advantage of the data set. So like GOP, Geofield in particular, its primary focus is we want to store geospatial data in Drupal really, really well. And then all the other modules can do whatever they want with that. Uh, Geocoder is a module that basically allows you to take things like, um, you know, I want to find out where Copper Mountain, Colorado is on a map. Um, you know, we're blessed to have things like Google Maps where you can just type it into a search and it'll find it for you. But if, you, if you're trying to do that on your own, uh, you know, most mapping software doesn't actually know what that is. So geocoding is the process of converting something like a um, string of Copper Mountain, Colorado into the coordinates that actually get rendered on the map. Um, geocoder uh, will um, plug into a wide variety excuse me, of systems. Um, you know, you can take advantage of um, Google's uh, geocoding software, Bing is another one, uh, OpenStreetMap uh, is another one. OpenStreetMap's a really interesting thing, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but like that's large database of geospatial information that's crowdsourced, so. Uh, that's Brandon, can I ask you a quick, quick question? About Absolutely. That? So you, so the basic of, of the idea behind geocoder is that you give it a string and it, it uses some mechanism to figure out where that is on a map. Yeah. So that gives you the coordinates of that. So, you know, if I say Chicago, Illinois, it'll give me uh, 41 north and negative 86-ish. I used to get this presentation a lot in Chicago. So, it's, <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, so it, it gives you that those coordinates back. Yeah, cool. And how does it do that? Is there like a library that you that is downloaded to that has that algorithm? Or I'm just curious. Sure. Uh, so... Uh, Geocoder relies primarily on um, third-party APIs, um, so there's a very lightweight library that's um, kind of baked into the Geocoder module that um, will basically, it's, it's basically a wrapper around all these different API calls, so it, ping, it asks Google, hey, where's Cooper Mountain? Here you go, and then it gives you back its information and that sort of thing. Um, in the wider coding community, there's um, I'll be sure to add some links to this later as when we actually share the slides, but in the wider coding community, there's actually uh, quite a few libraries that are really good at this um, as well. Uh, there's Geocoder PHP, um, which does basically what Geocoder the module does, but just from a more code level standpoint. And the nice part about Geocoder PHP is that Geocoder the module um, supports probably like seven or eight different um, external APIs. Geocoder PHP, the, the library, supports like 20 something and does a lot of extra stuff for it. So one of the things that I would like to see long term is Geocoder actually relying on that library versus this home co homegrown thing that we've built over the years um, because that's hard, hard to work with. Um, there's another library that I, I wrote that's on GitHub called Geocoder.js, which does the exact same thing but on the client side. Um, and so, so the client side is basically your browser is asking for the request versus your server. And that's really important when you're dealing with things like Google who rate limits you on how many requests you can ask per day per IP address. So if your server is, the, uh, is only asking for one IP address, you get like 2,500 hits a day, which is probably okay for some applications, but not great if you have a lot of traffic. Um, whereas if you're doing a client side, you can spread that um, request around uh, to you know a wide variety of computers, and you tend not to run into um, rate limits until much much later. Yeah. So that's awesome. Can we get a link to the repo? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll actually just pull it up right now. I'll just uh, yeah. So if you go on GitHub.com, it's a uh, geocoder-php. So it's geocoder-php is the parent um, organization. And then uh, Geocoder JS is the um, library that does that. So, so. It still hooks up to, this, to, to these 20, 20 some APIs, external APIs, but, but executes it has on the, the client side. Right? Yeah, it executes on the client side. Unfortunately, it only connects to about three or four um, right now, but it's, um, and that's mainly because the initial work that we did was kind of establishing what that plugin architecture looks like. 
um, but it's relatively easy to add that, um, add extra things. Uh, and right now it supports like the major ones. It supports Google, Bing, and uh, OpenStreetMap, so. Great. Just as a solicitation, if this group is able to help out in any way, are you guys open to that? And, um, like, for instance, you mentioned that you'd love to see GeoCoder roll out on GeoCoder PHP. Mm -hmm. If we were able to help with our limited experience, would that be welcome or? That would absolutely be welcome. I'm actually going to try to talk a little bit about, like, how you guys can help in general okay. at the end. So, Sorry, uh, no, no worries. But, yes, the, the help is much, much needed. So, uh, uh, so after GeoCoder, uh, I... There are, so there's the open layers and leaflet modules. Um, both of those are also JavaScript libraries that are, that power Slippy Maps. So Slippy Map is basically like a Google map where um, the expectation is, is that you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can like slide a set of um, static image tiles across, that, that make up your map across the thing. So when, when we say Slippy Map, it's basically just a Google map kind of thing. Um, but both open layers and leaflet are open source um, uh, JavaScript libraries that can use a wide variety of tile sets. And we'll talk a little bit more later about how we can actually make those tile sets and kind of get the look and feel and show the information that you need on um, data if you want it. Um, and then uh, the last module is the IP geolocation views and maps module, which is quite the mouthful. Uh, it is uh, basically the kitchen sink of modules uh, for the mapping stuff. Uh, so the top four modules are, are fairly limited in scope and what they do. Like, you know, we try to keep the amount of things that a particular module does to a minimum to keep it easy to maintain. Uh, what IP geolocation views and maps does is it adds a lot of niceties to, a, you know, not just the geofield um, stack, but some of the other mapping stacks that are available um, in Drupal. And so it, it does things like some really interesting views integration. It, um, you know, it allows you to do um, view searches where you can ask things like, uh, show me all the nodes or all the pieces of content on my site that are within five miles of my particular user. And it uses uh, the browser to ask, you know, hey, where are you? And then, you know, does that kind of search. Um, and it, I mean, it really does like a couple of dozen of really random, awesome, cool things that are, you know, in and of themselves not that great, but taken as a package, like there's, it's, it is really just the, the kitchen sink of that. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to show a couple of things real quick and uh, with uh, some of the Drupal mapping modules, feel free to stop and ask, hey, Brandon, that doesn't make sense. What are you doing kind of thing? Um, and we can kind of go from there. This high altitude is crazy for talking. <laughs> yeah, feel free to grab water and Right here. <laughs> Brought my own. <laughs> cool. So this is a um, content type that I created for this particular site called Basic Geofield. And this is about as bare bones as you can get on with Geofield. So we're going to say Copper Mountain is the node that I want. Uh, this is just a regular body field, so you can put whatever in it. Uh, down here is uh, my geo field, and uh, you'll notice that I'll have a latitude and longitude asked for it, and you'll notice that it's already pre-populated because I've set this particular one up uh, to ask, hey, you know, where are you? Um, normally on the, on the browser, it would ask you, there, um, so I'm currently in Chrome, there would be a little bar on the top that says, hey, do you want to share your... Um, location with this particular site. Uh, because I was testing this out this morning to make sure that it still worked, uh, I already did that. <laughs> so it, um, you know, so it already pre-populated my latitude and longitude. I can save it. And then it is hooked up to, uh, so Geofield does come with a bundled Google map implementation. Uh, it's very basic. It's basically there for um, sanity checks. Like, you know, does this work? Is this actually the location I want? That sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so that was really easy just to say like, hey, where am I? Here it is right there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can change how that's displayed pretty easily through, um, through the display types for the field view or for the, for the node. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Drupal, um, fields have three components to them. They have um, you know, the type of storage that they do. So that's the, um, like that's the field type itself. 
Um, there's how you add the information to your site, which is the uh, widget that's associated with it, and then there's how you display it, and that's the formatter. Um, and so you can, and so Geofield comes with quite a few different ways to set this up. Um, about half of these options here come bundled with Geofield itself. Uh, so well-known text um, is, you know, just it's a pretty basic database um, way of expressing a um, line or a point or whatnot. Um, GeoJSON is basically the same thing but in a JSON format and is really useful for um, a lot of uh, web applications and we'll kind of show some of that off later. Uh, the next three are pretty esoteric. Uh, KML is uh, Google Earth, K GPX is a GPS unit format. Um, Geohash is kind of interesting. It's a, it's a way to, um, for... Who, does anyone not know what Apache Solar is? Cool. Uh, okay, so Apache Solar is basically a search engine um, indexing tool that you can tie into Drupal. Um, there's a, quite a few, there's, there's two main modules that you can use with that. There's Search API and Apache Solar. Um, but the benefit that um, Apache Solar gives you is that it's a, um, it allows you to do things like faceted searching. So if you've ever been to like Amazon and you look for, you know, let's say, well, here's an example. I, w I was playing frisbee golf up here, or disc golf up here uh, on the mountain a couple of days, or yesterday. Uh, lost two of my discs because I, I'm not a very good long distance thrower. Uh, so I came home, and, or went back to the uh, hotel, and was like, okay, well, I need to get some more discs. Uh, so, you know, I searched for my disc, and on the left-hand side on, um, on Amazon, you, you tend to have a bunch of, so if I just look for disc golf, um, they'll have, like, you know, the entire list. But on the left-hand side, it'll do things like by, filter by manufacturer, filter by color, filter by weight, filter by whatever. So that's what a faceted search is. It's basically being able to show, like, here's different pieces of metadata that's associated with your content. Um, fil be, let's be able to list those and then filter by that. And so Solar does that really, really well. Um, and so what geohashing is, is a way to store geospatial information inside solar that gives you the ability to say, show me everything that is within this particular range of uh, content. And it's, really, and it's set up in a way where it's really fast to index that and that sort of thing. Is solar yes. Yeah, since uh, solar 4, I think, um, which is relatively recent, last year-ish or so. Um, so the, the trick with doing solar searches for geospatial stuff is that you can't ask questions like show me th every item that's within 50 miles of my particular location uh, or of a particular location but what you can ask are questions like show me the 50 closest things to this particular location and so it's a very, dis it's a very subtle difference but if you can live with that, then you can do some really interesting stuff with solar. Um, and then uh, just kind of looking at the other stuff. So open layers is a map. Um, so you know, I already showed you know the, the Google map. Uh, this is just another format for that. Uh, Leaflet's another display for it. Uh, I think Leaflet actually is broken right now. So Geofield is on Geo the. Uh, there's the original Geofield for Drupal 7, so Geofield 1.0, and then there's Geofield 2.0. And I don't think the leaflet module is quite updated yet, but they just recently, like this week, got a new maintainer, so that should come soonish. Um, one of the nice things that they have is a, and I can show this off for the open layers version of it. Uh, let's go to manage fields. We are going to edit the widget. Uh, so geocode from another field is, you know, basically you pick a field, um, any arbitrary field, and you can geocode from that. Um, the, the cool one to kind of show off is the open layers map. And so you can actually add your data in via a map. Uh, so let's say I want to show this off. I can just draw my point and say you know what, I really want to be back home in DC instead of Cooper Mountain, or Copper Mountain. And save it. And there we are. That's actually really close to my house. That's, <laughs> that's pretty good for being zoomed out so far. 
And can you do like line strings and other mm -hmm. geometry for that? Yep. Yeah, so there's three tools here. So that's the polygon, the line, and the point. So if I wanted to draw this instead, save it. It's right there. Yeah, and so the leaflet module, so in the leaflet world on the JavaScript side, there's a, it's actually very pluggable and extendable as well. Um, and there is a um, module, or there's a plugin for Leaflet called Leaflet Draw, which basically does the same sort of thing. Um, in general, Open Layers is more fully featured, but a bit older, and so like it has some cruft that's involved with it. Leaflet is kind of the new hotness; it's what people like using for this kind of map stuff, and uh, so like uh, lots of things kind of come with that. Like it visually, it looks a little bit better. The UX is a little bit nicer. Um, like any like new trendy kind of thing is going to show up probably in Leaflet more so than Open Layers. Um, open Layers is not like dead or anything. I mean, they they're getting really close to releasing Open Layers three, which is kind of their response to Leaflet. Um, yeah. Is there a lot of the users switch between uh, entering data through their map or a fields, or is that always in the background? Uh, so the question is, can you switch the user uh, or can the end user? Switch those, right? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, without the proper site permissions, um, I mean, you can give an end user the permission to do that, um, and it would be, it wouldn't be trivial, but it would be a like a, <laughs> yeah, it would be a low to medium amount of effort to create a widget that would allow you to do that sort of thing because all the components are there. You basically would have to do some sort of like switching kind of thing for that, um, and actually the open layers. Uh, the question is like security issues with allowing end users to do that. Uh, no more so than uh, any other information that you're trying to add to the site. So I mean, it, in general, I mean, not to steal Greg's talk from a few days ago, but in general, the more lockdown you have a site, the more secure it is and vice versa. So it's just, or at least that's, that's Brandon's two second version of that. Uh, if you, like the more things that you allow a user to do, the more likely it is to be broken in some way or another. Um, I would consider exposing an end user to like one of our widgets for Geofill to be a really, really low risk. Um, but, but yeah, did that, did that answer that? Okay, cool. Are the permissions granular enough to allow a user to like, you know, you can create a new role Mm -hmm. and allow that role to just change the widget of the geofield, or would, would you have to enable uh, permissions to edit fields for for this role? Uh, you would. So the question is, is like, what permission level would you actually have to expose to let a u end user switch their input widget? Um, and I that is a very good question. I think the answer is is that you would have to allow them to add or edit the edit nodes across the site. Let's look that up though because I don't know that for sure. Uh, it, yeah, so I think you would have to give them access to administer content types, which is a not a role you want to give to an end user. Um, and because you would have so the way that it currently stands, you would have to go up a level and deal with it on the node, node level versus on the field level. Um, if you wanted that kind of functionality, again, you could probably write in a, another widget for Geofield that exposes that sort of thing. Um, and so the widget would be something like a map or lat long input kind of thing. And actually the open layers uh, map widget used to have a, uh, an input like an input like that um, back on Drupal 6 days. So another reason to stick around for Drupal 6 for a little bit is <laughs> um, I don't <laughs> yeah uh, I don't recall why that went away. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, um, and then like the location module itself actually like their widget I believe also provides that. Um, where and so with the location module you can only store points so that's definitely a you know if, if you can deal with that limitation then you know that's a way to go if you want that sort of thing as well um, 
And I think, so the, there's also another module, not to continue to add like modules upon modules upon modules, there's also another module called geolocation, um, which is kind of a competitor to geofield. It does a lot of, a lot of very similar things. Um, I think Geofield is better for data storage and that kind of thing. It's a lot more flexible from that standpoint. But Geolocation actually has a better widget input widget. So um, that might be another place to explore if you're not looking to code for something like that. And their widget actually does work with Geofield now. So that's, that's a nicety. So, um, yeah, I, so trying to be um, considerate of time and that sort of thing. Uh, I think I'm going to kind of slide on to some, some of the other external tools. Um, I, again, I'll be around all day basically, so you know, feel free to come you know, bug me about or ask questions and that sort of thing. Um, one thing to note about the current state of Drupal mapping modules is that they're really good at working with limited amounts of data that's associated with a node or with a piece of content. So for example, it's you, if you want to find if you want to associate a single location to a piece of content, that's really easy to do. Um, if you want to do something like I need to show, like if you're doing like metadata sort of things and I want to show the bounding, or I, I want to store the bounding box of my data set, that's pretty easy to do and to store. Um, if you want to work with a, a data set like this, uh, who, did anybody, was anybody Noah here? Thank you. You basically are filling the rest of my talk, so thank you. <laughs> um, if you want to work with a data set like this, uh, so this is, uh, so there's a link on the bottom. Uh, it's, uh, Noah provides quite a few different interesting pieces of data sets, but the, this particular one is a, uh, is a shape file that has every tornado, um, or every recorded tornado from 1950 to 2013. Uh, that clocks in at about 57,000 um, pieces of information, and Drupal does not handle this sort of thing really well right now. Um, bec mainly because you, if you wanted to work with this currently in Drupal, you would probably want to use something like the Data Explorer module that you guys have in your uh, distribution, and then find some way to kind of do the glue code to connect that to other things. Um, but you know, just straight out of the box outside of that, you know, this is just a lot of information to drop into your Drupal site. And while you can do that, you're probably going to have a bad time. So um, what we're gonna talk about now are some tools and some techniques that you can use that you can still integrate into your Drupal site, um, you know, through a variety of methods, but um, make working with larger data sets just like so, so, so much easier to, to go with. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, Mapbox and TileMill. Um, so what TileMill is, so, so Mapbox is the company and they provide um, a set of tools that allow people to create uh, static tile images um, based on open or any data sets that they have available. Uh, they primarily work with OpenStreetMap data, so OpenStreetMap is um, think of it as like the Wikipedia of mapping. Uh, it's in, um, it's a system that that or it's a data set where uh, people all over the world um, come together and they you know they add um, you know like where roads and where streets and where you know like restaurants and that sort of thing are. Um, in places like the United States, it's not as uh, useful because we have things like Google that do a really really good job of mapping. Um, data sets here, um, but A, if you're really into the open source stuff, you know, OpenStreetMap is a great alternative. It does have a really good data set, and B, it's actually really good for humanitarian purposes, um, because, you know, when, like, Typhoon comes in and, like, destroys, like, you know, some, you know, island or somewhere, you know, it's really easy for people to come in, uh, you know, for humanitarian workers to come in, update maps on the fly with, you know, things like, you know, like aerial drones and GPS units and that sort of thing. And you can have a very quick turnaround on like what the map is for a particular area, and then that's just, I mean, that's like life-saving. I mean, like knowing where you are in those kinds of situations is like incredibly useful. And so, um, so that's that's the two-minute pitch for OpenStreetMap, which is awesome. But so TileMill um, works with that, and it can also work with your custom data set. So if you have anything that's in a shapefile, which is like the ArcGIS stuff. 
uh, if you have anything that's in like GeoJSON or you know uh, you can even work with like uh, CSV files that if you specify a latitude and longitude point you can work with that kind of stuff so it works with a wide variety of data and you can drop it in onto uh, a map uh, so this is like the like two minute version of uh, what we are of the data set that we we're showing earlier. It's the exact same thing, um, where we have uh, the base layer uh, that uh, Mapbox provides, and then just lines um, for each particular set. And already we have something that's a little bit more useful because it's on a slippy map. So we can you know zoom in, we can zoom out, uh, and that sort of thing, which is pretty cool. But what's nice about it is that um, you can style your, your data sets based on the meta information that's associated with it. And so in this particular data set, we have things like the magnitude of it. So, you know, if it's like an F1 to an F5 range. And so like this is a, uh, it doesn't show up as well on the, I should have gone with a little bit more high contrast um, uh, color choice here. But if you zoom in, you can kind of see that already, you know, you kind of get a little bit more of an idea of like where are, um, you know, higher density, like where are higher um, magnitude tornadoes more likely to happen. So you see, uh, you know, some down here in the south, you kind of see a few over here and that sort of thing. Um, and that's actually really easy to do and I'll show you how you do that here in just a second. Um, with that metadata, it's also really easy to kind of do things like... This. So this is the same sort of thing. Um, you know, this is just the financial impact of that. So the darker the green, the more um, damage the tornado cost. Um, again, high altitude um, and not breathing. Uh, <laughs> so, so again, you know, you you know, you have you know, just you know, uh, you get a little bit better picture of what's actually happening on the ground there. Uh, so these are all built that file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then just one more. Um, don't know why it was zoomed into Pennsylvania, but this is a uh, number of injuries. And this one's actually this is actually kind of an interesting data set because if you looked at the other two, um, it still was like pretty. Um, you know, it, it was a pretty even distribution. Just kind of looking at it visually, like you know, you had a fairly decent gradient between all of them. Here, it's there's not a ton of injuries that actually happens with tornadoes, you know, or at least recorded injuries based on this. So th again, the darker the color, the more injuries that you have, and so you see a lot of like really light colors here, but then you see a few like this one that ran through like southern Michigan and northern Indiana, this another one in Indiana, that sort of thing. So you can actually start to kind of like suss out some of the um, more details in that, which is kind of cool. <coughs> One real quick question, Brandon. Were you able to take NOAA data and actually render these? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so the, the NOAA data is provided. Um, I don't have the link up handy, but so the NOAA data is a shapefile. A uh, shapefile is like the old standard for storing geospatial data. Uh, it's um, put together by Esri, which is a, a company that does a lot of interesting mapping stuff. <laughs> um, if you've done any kind of GIS work, you know who Esri is, that they're kind of like the big big dog in that. And so shapefiles are like their legacy version of how you store sp geospatial information. And there's actually a ton of tools for taking that kind of information and applying it to a wide variety of um, systems. So TileMill in particular actually works with shapefiles directly, so there's no need for conversions or anything. Uh, I think I had to reproject this, but otherwise, um, that wasn't like that big of a deal at all. Um, and yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the open source tool sets that you can use to actually do some of that, that kind of work as well. Um, that work with other sources like your databases or, or map services? Yeah, so it, uh, the question is what other um, data sets can you work with? Um, so shapefiles are what I normally work with because I tend to do very static kinds of things. Uh, you can connect it to a Postgres database. <laughs> I think that's the only database set that you can work with. Yeah, so the PostGIS stuff, which is definitely useful. Um, and then you can also work with uh, GeoJSON, um, and you can work with uh, CSV files. Um, so if you're so the Postgres is nice because you can tie directly to the database. Um, 
geo like GeoJSON is good if um, like your particular database. So if you're like on Oracle or something, um, you know it's relatively trivial to get an export of that into a format like a GeoJSON file or something like that. Um, and so that's that's a good like GeoJSON is a good like neutral ground to work with. Like I mean, just let me give you an example of what it looks like. I mean, it's this is another handy tool that I neglected to put in the slide deck, by the way. Uh, Geojson.io. Uh, this is actually put together by the Mapbox people, and it's uh, a really easy way to. Uh, let me do a new one real quick. Uh, to create Geojson files um, by just simply drawing. So you'll notice here on the right, like this is what the format of Geojson looks like. Uh, so we have a feature collection. You can add, a, you can assign properties to it. We have a polygon here, then, and those are the various coordinates for it. Um, you know, things to note, um, like compared to like WKT, like this is a little bit more verbose, but it's a lot easier. Like, because it's JSON ultimately, it's super easy to use in like client side stuff, um, because it's all JavaScript, and that's like this is the format that that works really well in. Um, so I'll make sure to get geojson.io in here as well. But yeah, this is by the Mapbox people as well. You can do lots of interesting stuff with it. Um, I, I've used this for like if I need to add something to a map and I don't have like the source file for it, and it's something that's like relatively simple to do. Like, let's say I need to add like you know like five state capitals or something. It's really easy just to go and point those in, um, versus trying to find like a data set and doing filtering and that sort of thing. So. Um, so the thing with tile mill is that uh, what it ultimately produces are static maps. Um, and what I mean by static maps are, actually before I go into that, I want to show you how you, how you style those. Uh, so uh, the language that you use for styling these things is uh, Cardo CSS. Um, it's pretty similar, is anybody here familiar with GeoServer? Cool, so GeoServer has a CSS language that's associated with it that's like the simplified version of the, I forget how you normally style it, it's like an SLD XML file some sort of thing. Um, this is very similar to that, and what's nice about it is that you can do, um, so in this particular set, I have a layer called Tornado, and I'll show you what that looks like in Tile Mill here in a second. I have a layer called, um, called Tornado, um, I can specify like at various zoom levels how how do I want that line to render or that particular um, those particular features to render and then you can also kind of dig into the <coughs> um, to the metadata that's associated with it and then adjust accordingly um, and there's all kinds of different things that you can do you can adjust um, you can add like patterns to things you can add, adjust the line color the line width uh, fills opacity that sort of thing um, if you've done any sort of like CSS or CSS for like um, HTML or for just like web stuff in general, it's a very similar language, um, and it's really nice. Uh, so like in the so when we open up TileMill itself, so this is my data set. It's my data set for that. Uh, let me actually turn on the context layers here so that you actually can see that. Uh, Tomo will run on Macs, Windows, and um, Linux now, so you should be good wherever on that. Uh, and yeah, and so it's like adding a data set is really, really easy. Um, so you just define a data source here. You actually get a few different options. Um, so there's file. Oh, SQLite is another database that you can pull. I mean, SQLite is only sort of a database, but it's still a database kind of thing. Um, and then the PostGIS stuff. Hey, real quick, what are the other two buttons up there? Yeah. It's just really hard to see what sure, this one is the SQL Lite um, button. So if you have a, um, so SQL Lite is just a, another file based database system um, that's known for being really lightweight, um, in a good way, lightweight. So, uh, and then uh, PostGIS is PostGIS, you know, you can, it's Postgres Geospatial Awesomeness. So, um, with the data sources, one nice thing about TileMill is that it actually comes with bundled with a data set called the Natural Earth Database, um, which is um, basically it's a bunch of like publicly maintained um, high-level um, like geospatial databases. So 
it has things like um, lakes, points of interest, um, coastlines, uh, administration borders, so things like country and state level borders, uh, that sort of thing. And it's all formatted for it, so it's really easy to kind of work with there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and with Tomo, like it's pretty easy to just kind of like swap out your data set. So I have, I don't know if you can see that very well, but um, so I, I had the magnitude um, set up over here. And now, if I wanted to show like the injury data set and save that, you know, you get that. Uh, the yellow is a default that I set up here earlier for some debugging, so that's why there's some yellow in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really easy to just kind of like explore that kind of set. Um, if you need like a, a quick look up of like what's going on on a particular data set, um, it has a, a baby data explorer over here um, that's just basic spreadsheet sort of thing. You can't actually edit the data set, but you can kind of see what's, what's in it um, and see like what keys you're looking for and that sort of thing. So tile mill is pretty cool, um, but the problem with tile mill is that it ultimately only produces static um, maps. And so by a static map, I mean that if a user wants to do something like, uh, I want to filter down and only show the tornadoes that were magnitude F3 or higher, uh, you would have to re-render that for them um, on your own and provide that data set. And so if you have a very limited set of things that you can do, then TileML still works well for that. Um, <clears throat> but if you need a little bit more flexibility in how that data is displayed, uh, then you need something that's going to do a little bit more dynamic rendering um, with that. Uh, so GeoServer is actually a good solution for that sort of thing. Uh, GeoServer has traditionally been a little bit hard to install and work with, so I tend not to use it. Um, what I use for that instead is a uh, app called CardoDB. So what CardoDB is is a uh, it's a software as a service company. They're um, they're night funded, which basically means that they like so they. Um, like it's, it's basically like public grants and that sort of thing where they get their funding and all that. And they've uh, created a software as a service setup that allows you to, um, to render um, maps on the fly with the same tool set that you would get with, um, or the same components under the hood that you would get with something like TileMill. And that's really, really useful because it means that you can do things like take the same um, Cardo CSS that you were using to style your TileML stuff, um, if you were creating like a base layer for, for your maps, and use it in CardoDB to, like, you can just copy and paste it over and it, you know, mostly works. Like, usually there's a, a little bit of a translation between, like, um, you know, between, like, uh, metadata names and that sort of thing, but, like, it, it's pretty well set up. Uh, CardoDB um, targets uh, journalists as their um, primary audience for, for working with stuff. And what that, in, as a formal journalist, I feel like I can say this, uh, it basically means that it's really dumbed down. Like it is stupid easy to work with this. <laughs> um, but it's also actually really powerful because uh, uh, under the hood, it's a post GIS database and they provide an API where you can actually write queries straight in to get all the information that you store in there, which is really, really awesome. It also has some nice tools to be able to build out stuff like this, which is a heat map based off of the same set of data. Um, I didn't have to do any coding at all for this. I just dropped my data in and said, hey, make me a heat map. And, uh, you know, like you can kind of tweak the styling on it and that sort of thing, but like it's pretty, you know, um, pretty straightforward way to just kind of get like a better impression of like, okay, where are the areas that, you know, are hit hardest by tornadoes. Um, in this particular heat map, it's um, the size of the dot is keyed off to the uh, the magnitude of the tornado. Again, so you know that's um, you know so you you have lots of light small dots for low magnitude and so on and so forth. And you know the interface for working with this stuff is is pretty easy. Uh, just to kind of give a quick example of that. So again, I've, in this particular case, I've uploaded a, um, a shape file. It processes that. Uh, one interesting gotcha that um, I had to do 
for this is that um, with the particular data set, the, the particular NOAA data set, all the metadata was stored as strings um, and so instead of numbers. And so, you know, as a developer, that, that's an important distinction because I can't add strings together. If I add 1 plus 2 as a string, I get 12 and not 3. Um, because it just puts the two together. And so um, I, because CardoDB um, tries to be smart about that, it um, you know, pre-formatted all of these as, as strings. And so I had to go back in and um, process that data set to, to give me numbers on that. And I'll show you how I did that here in a little bit. But that's, um, and actually, now that I'm looking at it, I think you can just do the type change there and it'll try to do like something really smart with that. I was actually trying to learn a new tool, which I'll show you here in a little bit, but um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's how those things go. Um, and then for actually creating the maps themselves, um, like if I wanted to visualize the status set, Then I'm go over here to map view. Again, there's my basic styling that I set up from earlier. Um, I can do queries to to ask, like you know, I only want to show these certain things. Um, it has a you know a wizard set up, so like the bubble map was the heat map thing that I showed earlier. Um, I can also do by category, so if we wanted to do, uh, let's see, magnitude, and I can show it based off of that, and so, you know, F0 to F5, and then, you know, it, it does some nice things with um, trying to set some, like, good default colors and that sort of thing for you and all that. Uh, I can do a chloropleth of that which doesn't work as well for this particular data set because it's um, lines and not polygons, but what's so. up? So, all so this is all back end stuff that's still creating a static map and shapefile. Yeah, so, so the way that you would incorporate something like CardoDB is that um, the easiest way is through like an iframe. Um, so you can just kind of drop that into a piece of content and that sort of thing. Um, because CardoDB has a really good REST API associated with it, you can actually, you could in theory actually write code that would do things like, um, I have this data set of tornado data, I want to create a node that has a, that's basically a report on that data. And so I would have a field on it for like, um, you know, the magnitude, the wind speed, things like that, like whatever I wanted to filter on it. You create that node based on those filters, and then based on that data, you could ask CardoDB to render you a map um, with those particular filters set. Um, and this is actually this actually isn't a static map; it's um, it's all live rendered, which is really nice. So, like, you can actually like on the fly as an end user, you know, through JavaScript, you can create like drop downs and say like, hey, I want to show, like, I want to look at this particular. Um, you know, set of information and then have that live filtering. So something closer to what you would get with some of the Esri kinds of tool sets. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no. They, they... Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can totally add more records if you want. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, so like if you're trying to add data to this particular thing, uh, I'm currently on a free demo version of this, so I don't, oh good, I have one more table, excellent. Uh, so if I wanted to add a new table, um, so there, there's quite a few formats you can work with. Um, Supported data formats. All right, so we have the shape files. Um, you know, you can do OpenStreetMap dump, that kind of thing. Uh, so if you're talking about Esri data specifically, um, shape files are, is your common point into that. 
Um, because this is another Postgres database, I, I, I thought you could do like a connection. You could write a connection to, to connect your Postgres database to something like this. Um, because again, you have a REST API that exposes raw SQL. So if you wanted to dump that kind of stuff in, then it would be relatively trivial to write that sort of thing. Um, you would probably get into um, issues with like data syncing and that sort of thing. So like deciding what pieces of information to overwrite whenever you do the sync and that kind of thing. But that's, I mean, that, that's a solvable thing. Or, or at least I think it would be. So, uh, Brandon, yeah. if uh, some of our people here are with, with every mm -hmm. uh, Services as well. Mm -hmm. Could they take that approach that you mentioned with CryptoDB of writing a, uh, a node or a content type that has those filters based on the parameters of interest mm -hmm. and uh, hook those up with the, against a program those against the API or the REST services that have S3 mm -hmm. and, get, and have REST S3 render, render the map and so on? Yeah, you, you could definitely do that. So so the question is, is could you do like all the stuff that I was talking about with CardoDB but with the Esri stack? And Esri does actually have a really nice, um, I say that like that's a surprise, they have a really nice um, uh, admin, or not admin, uh, like web UI kind of component. They Like they're kind of in, a, in an inter interesting place because like they were the big dog in mapping stuff for, for so long and then Google came along and then like other open source people came along and so they've had to, I wouldn't say that they're playing catch up but they're having to deal with the fact that there are other like people showing up now uh, doing this kind of stuff for far, far cheaper than you can do with that. Um, going back to the original question, could you do all this with the Esri stuff? Absolutely. Uh, there are some modules um, that provide some sort of linkage to that. Um, I caught a, or I talked to a guy at DrupalCon Austin um, that, uh, like, he was like an Esri sales guy or something that was kind of talking about, um, I, I forget the name of the module and I feel terrible for it, but if you look up uh, Esri Drupal, I'm sure it'll show up. And my understanding of how it worked was that it was, um, it would give you uh, a quick listing of like all the maps that you have on the Esri side of things, and then you can uh, embed those into nodes and that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you can definitely work with the Esri sort of stuff um, because you know I I come from like the open source side of things. I tend to try to stick within that data um, that stack for better or for worse. But uh, but yeah, that's that's definitely a thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. So the question is like, uh, you know, connections between like GeoServer and Esri. Um, you know, that's not something I have a ton of experience in, but my understanding is, is that Esri has really good REST APIs and GeoServer has really good REST APIs. So it would be, you, know, you basically just have to get that glue code together to get them to talk to each other. So depending on which direction you want data to flow and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah. Um, so another another stack that's kind of interesting. So both of these are kind of work around um, basic slippy maps, and slippy maps are cool. Um, but one of the really interesting things that's that's kind of happened over the last couple of years is that. Um, Browsers like Chrome have really led the way in like JavaScript performance, which has allowed us to do a lot of really, really interesting things on the client side from a data visualization perspective. Um, and so there's a library in particular called D3 um, that does, it's pretty much the most awesome thing ever right now. Like I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying working with it. So. Uh, so D3 is, it's not really a charting library, it's more like a uh, grammar of graphics kind of library, so it allows you to do things, and I know that's probably a weird distinction, but basically it's, um, it'll, it breaks down the way that you um, would say, like, I want a bar chart into its specific components, so you have, like, you know, the legend, um, the, you know, the x-axis, the y-axis, um, you know, axis, axis in general, um, your actual rendered bar, bars and that sort of thing. It breaks it all down into a relatively, uh, into those individual pieces and it makes it really easy, um, or it, it, it makes it possible to do 
not just like really simple like you know like basic charts that you would get out of Excel, but to do like some really really interesting visualizations. Um, if you look up D3JS, the home page is just filled with really cool, interesting um, things that you can do with um, with D3. And so what I have here is just a really basic map um, that again has, uh, and you can't see the map part of that at all, but with the power of live demos, we can adjust the styling on that so you can actually see what we're looking at. So D3 base works with uh, SVG files, and so that's what it ultimately creates. And what's really cool about um, SVG files, so they're scalable vector graphics, they're renderable on, in the browser, and what's really cool about them is that you can style them with CSS. So again, you, know, you get a lot of that flexibility that you want in that. Um, and so if we go back to here, uh, did that help at all? Let's see. There we go. So it's going to take a minute or, or a little bit for. There we go. So there's there's the tornado stuff. Um, you know, it's really easy to just kind of like do your styling and that sort of thing based on that as well. Um, cool things about D3. Um, you'll notice that you know Alaska doesn't really sit in Mexico, and nor does Hawaii. Um, you know, typically when you work with slippy maps, uh, you, you're working with the Mercator projections, which is like kind of the standard for that sort of stuff now. Um, but D3, the, the Mike, the guy that's um, Mike Bortok, I, I say that like I know him. Um, the, he um, like with the Geo stuff, he's really um, into supporting like a more like fully featured kind of thing. So you can do like all kinds of different projections and that sort of thing. Uh, this is just a Alberta's. USA projection, so it's uh, equal area, um, and then drops down uh, Alaska and Hawaii down here. So you sacrifice shape the the shape of it for the size of it, basically, um, when you're trying to do the rendering of that. Um, and again, with D3, like it comes bundled with like 20 or 30 different projections that you can do for the mapping stuff. So it, like that's that's pretty cool to work with. And to actually create that this particular map is not that big of a deal. Uh, so I set a couple of variables to define, um, you know, like to define a width and height. Right here I'm saying add an SVG element with that. Here I'm defining my path, and so the path is basically the shapes uh, that get rendered on the screen. Um, here I'm requesting my US data, so I have a um, this is actually this actually isn't uh, the U.S. data isn't um, topo JSON or isn't geo JSON but topo JSON. So topo JSON is is like a cousin to geo JSON. Um, it's um, so instead of storing individual shapes, it stores the paths between all of them, and then it renders or and then it decides that the shapes are made up of these individual paths. And so that saves you a lot of space because if you have something like a shape file of um, state borders. You know, um, like Colorado shares a border with like several other states around it. Instead of storing that border for multiple places, you're just storing that border once, like the shape of that once, and then you're saying, okay, Colorado is made up of these like 12 borders. And so you get a really nice um, uh, like savings in size, which um, ends up translating into like speed and rendering later, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, so like you know, grabbing that data is, is so you so D three you request that data, and then here we say uh, with D three they have a really interesting concept um, when it's actually rendering data. Um, you can select a piece of data and then uh, or select a particular component of data, apply data to it, and then after that you get three options to work with it. You have enter, exit, and update. And so inner means that you're creating new shapes, exit means you're removing shapes, and update means that you're just changing some metadata about it. And what's really cool about that is that that means that you can create this particular, so like in this particular case, I'm grabbing the data and then I'm just doing like a, a quick render for um, you know, each shape. So um, like I'm appending the path element, um, adding a class to each one so that I can style it however I need to, and then actually attaching the path itself, so the what defines the shape. 
Um, but if I want to update my data source, I can just update it, and then assuming I code this properly, the data set just updates. Like I don't have to go through and like re-render the whole thing. It just it knows like what's new and what's what's different about it. And so you can have a lot of really interesting uh, visualizations based off of that. Yeah. No, no, that's not a stupid question at all. So, like, how would you integrate this into your Drupal site? So, because this is all JavaScript, um, JavaScript is kind of like the glue code for web stuff in general. Like, you can take a JavaScript or like pieces of JavaScript and run it on pretty much any like backend stack that you want. So, whether that's Drupal or WordPress or um, you know SharePoint or you know whatever else you need to do. Um, so on a very superficial level, you know, you can just drop in like the JavaScript that you have um, that you you have to render this. Like so, in this particular example, it's just a static HTML file. I can take this JavaScript and inject it on a page and render my map there. Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which files do we need? No, that's that's a fair question. So, what you would probably so if I were doing if I wanted to render this here, and actually, we are over on time. If you guys will grant me, yeah, if you guys will grant me some time to do it, we can actually try it over here, and we'll we'll see how it goes. Um, usual caveats about live demo, um, but yeah. Okay, so I have in my hand. static HTML file with some styling and the script tags that we need to, to render that, that particular map. So if we were going to add this to our Drupal site, uh, you would create a module. So we're going to do that real quick. Uh, Real quick while Brandon is working. Um, so I'm just looking at here at the schedule, and coffee break is until 10:45. So if you guys are cool to stick around till then, and Brandon's willing to go till 10:45, we can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Just wanted to make sure you weren't rushing because of the clock. No, 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 no. Um, no, this is interesting. I, I'm kind of intrigued if I can actually do this in 10 minutes or not. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Well, the problem, you know, full disclosure, I I actually have been doing a lot more um, front-end JavaScript work lately and not as much Drupal. So I'm actually slightly rusty on the Drupal side of things as far as, like, quickly doing things. So this will make it fun. <laughs> we can all do it together. Yes. All right, so we need to create a module. We need our info file, so I'm just copying this from Geofield and then getting rid of all the stuff that we don't really need. Um, we're going to do so. The only real things that you need in an info file is you need to find a name and you need to find what version of core you're associated with. So that's pretty straightforward. We'll save that. As. Come on, mouse. Let's go. Create a new folder, call it just ESIP. And then SIP.info. Then we need a uh, dot module file, so we'll call this DSIP.module. Alright. Let's play. Does Brandon remember PHP? <laughs> I mean, yes, I know what PHP is. We've got this. Um, all right. So we're gonna. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a um, hook menu callback to, and, and so basically that's setting a routing path to say when I go to X URL, I want you to run this function. So what we're gonna do is. We're going to hook menu. We're going to search search for hook menu because the options that hook menu give you are crazy. Okay. So he, 
full disclosure, disclosure, this is how I do the Google code too. I'm like, okay, let's go to Google first, search the function that I want to implement. Uh, if you're on a Mac and you're a developer, Dash is a really cool application. Um, I think it's like 10 bucks to plug something else. Uh, basically, it's just straight up documentation. Um, and I use it whenever I get, do presentations and need to finish up um, demos and stuff on a plane. So, because it's all downloaded locally, it works out pretty well. It has some other niceties too, like it ties into a bunch of other stuff. So, all right, I want. Always to say that it is important whenever you are working with a full system and you are implementing a core in the report, you have to be substituted in the word for by the name of the module. So you, if you are paying attention, we call this module is it? Mm -hmm. And this work that is implementing, the work menu, now it's called instead of work menu, it's called is it menu. Right. And the people bootstrap and API will understand exactly how to place these in the whole framework of Google. So it is, it's those, those kind of small details, that's, that's where the core is important. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the hook system is interesting. It's, it's kind of like a, um, an event system. Um, like if you've ever done any kind of coding where you have events and that sort of thing, it's, it's kind of similar, but it's, it's like a dumb version of event system. Um, because all it does to look for these things is, um, you know, like you were saying, you know, it, instead of a hook underscore menu, it's looking for whatever module name underscore menu. So you have to be really careful with how you um, name your functions because you can do something like, oh, I want to call this like, you know, render node, but there's a hook node, so you know that gets called as that, and then you'll probably have a bad time then. So, all right. Uh, I know I am missing something for hook menu because you have to have permissions to actually see it. Uh, so with hook menu, the bare minimum that you need are, uh, yeah, access coordinates is the other thing. The bare, thing, bare minimum that you need is page callback. I think you need title. Um, you might not actually need title, but we're going to give it a title anyway. Uh, and then access arguments. And so what access arguments is, is um, there are actually two um, settings that you can set here. Uh, so there's, what is it, access callback I think is the other one? Yeah, so access callback and access um, arguments. Um, and so basically you're just trying to tell uh, Drupal how, like, how it should act, like try to protect the rendering of this page. So if you don't have permissions to do something like this, um, you know, that's useful for like if you want to pr like only show pages to certain roles and that sort of thing. Um, I'm probably doing something that Greg told you not to do and just setting this to true. So <laughs> this means that this gets rendered all the time. And that's okay. And then this is my sanity check to make sure that this works. I'm just going to do return high. And so what should happen is when we go to ESAP map, we should get high there. So we'll need to enable the module. Okay, so, right, okay, 
Yes, it's all good. So, so assuming that I got that working, which yeah. probably will require bourbon and whatever, but yeah. we'll. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's great. It's amazing. Just a quick pitch. So we've got this working group time. Uh, yeah. All right. So to actually render the map, we'll need to add our JavaScript files that we had before. So uh, there's a function in Drupal, Drupal 7 called uh, Drupal underscore add underscore JSS. Uh, there are quite a few ways to set this up. Um, just to make sure that I'm not telling you something wrong. Yeah, so that's the simplest way to do it. Um, so you would just do the path to wherever it is. So, so in this particular case, you would do path to D3, and then path to custom map render. Uh, and so like that's just your JavaScript, that's your business logic for actually rendering the map. Um, you'll probably, and that's ultimately all you would have to do to get that code injected onto the page. Now the code, like the code that I have on my static version, um, you would probably need to update to do a few things like, um, so my current version replaces the body with this SVG object. You probably don't want to do that on your Drupal site. You probably want to define a div on your, so if I did something like return div id, and again this is not the real way to do it, but because for demo purposes, um, we'll go div id my map. And so if you did this, um, instead of replacing the body, you would adjust the code to look for my map and put your map inside of that. Uh, my map would be a, a rendered div in the DOM that's getting rendered on the on the site. Um, so it, it wouldn't be a field necessarily. It would just it would be in the markup that gets displayed. Th that this is it. Just returning this string gets that rendered into the page. So if your if your JavaScript is looking for a selector to insert the map at some div ID my map. Oh. Yeah. 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 Right. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, and so like the other thing that you would probably have to watch out for on your JavaScript side is making sure that all your paths line up properly. Um, because my, like the static version that I have expects everything to be like underneath that particular path. You can't really expect that to happen on, on the Drupal side. Um, because you know that URL could be anywhere. You could do a path alias to it and that sort of thing. Uh, and Drupal provides tools to basically normalize your URLs on that. So, uh, well, sad face for not being able to do that because of hook menu, but that's okay. Sure. Waiting for things to. Sure. Um, that's actually, I could probably talk for an hour on that. So, <laughs> um, so the very short version of that is Drupal minor version, so anything within 7, within 8, and that sort of thing, you're usually pretty safe with upgrades on there. Um, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 is a huge lobotomy to Drupal. So we've basically modernized the framework um, in a way where um, it should make it easier to do like some of those more incremental upgrades in the long run, and we've done a lot of like nice things on that. The downside to that is that any Drupal 7 module that you have currently is just not going to work in Drupal 8. 
Um, now, there are ways to code for that. Um, so views module is actually a really interesting example of that. So views um, is now integrated into core, but it, let's assume that it wasn't for whatever reason. Um, the views module is actually a like an entire like library of code to do all the stuff that's separate from Drupal, and then it ties into Drupal for things like the UI and for you know, like into like regular hook systems and that sort of thing. So if you have people that write their modules like that, um, <laughs> that you know it makes it easier to do those kinds of upgrades because like the the upgrade from seven to eight is is pretty brutal like i i've started the um uh like i've started the geofield upgrade um for drupal 8 it works right now i i can show you guys later if you want like what like what works now and what doesn't and that sort of thing um but i mean like you were saying on like as far as like vendors and stuff it really does depend on who's maintaining that module. And the thing about the Drupal community is that it's not that you're working with people like Esri or Microsoft or larger companies like that. You, For your main modules, you're probably working with a Drupal shop of some sort. So like I work at a company called Phase2 that's a large Drupal shop. Uh, Aqua is another one that does like lots of stuff. Uh, Palantir is another good one. I think you guys had some good experience with them doing some stuff. Um, you know, like there's probably about a dozen or so larger shops, but the vast majority of the other modules are just maintained by like people who had an itch to scratch. And so it depends on how, like, you know, how much of an itch they want to continue scratching. Uh, that being said as well, a lot of the stuff that I've shown in the second half of this are separate from Drupal. Um, and so depending on what your level of integration you want on that, it's, you know, like, like especially with the tile mill and the Carter DB stuff, like you can just add that as an iframe. And that's correct. Yeah, and so like between Drupal and seven and Drupal eight, um, that's you know the that hook particular hook has gone away, um, and actually the info file in general has gone away. Like it's like it's very very different. But I mean this is um, there are probably other ways that I could have added that added those JavaScript files without actually creating a module. Um, they vary in um, ability, they vary in like how secure that is and just how like maintainable that is. I mean what's nice about modules is that they're like small units of code that do like one thing really well or in theory that's what they do. Um, and so I, I mean I guess like this you know kind of going back to that if you're worried about like module like maintainability between seven and eight um, like it's basically a rewrite but there are a lot of people that are really invested in making sure that like at least like the top you know several hundred modules get pushed over so um, I don't know if that helps or hurts or what but Yeah. Well, I mean, there are, there are actually pretty like a few different answers to that. I, I would say, um, if I mean honestly, if you have a website and you haven't updated it in like three or four years, like from like an infrastructure standpoint, I would I think I would argue that it's you know you probably need to like look at that look at the content that you have there and and just reassess like what's going on because I mean the world like the the internet moves pretty quickly and it's a relatively low amount of investment for like a website now if you're doing like Drupal stuff is more infrastructure kinds of things like you're using it for like you know rest API's to like send like all kinds of complex stuff out and that kind of thing and you have lots of things relying on that from there, then yeah, I, I totally like feel your pain on that. Like that, that's hard. And you know, if you're if you're on Drupal seven, you do have the benefit of knowing that the community is going to support seven for the entire lifespan of Drupal eight. So you probably have a good five years that you can work on Drupal seven if you want. Um, Drupal six, there's actually a a um, um, kind of a a uh, group of people that are wanting to try to support Drupal 6 past um, the launch of Drupal 8. Um, so like as a community in general, we try to support like one version back. Um, so with Drupal, like the Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 thing, like there's actually, because 
Drupal 6 is kind of when a lot of people like got really excited about Drupal and there's just like a lot of people involved with it. There's, there are, you know, there's a group of people that are gonna be interested in that and like being able to maintain and, and do security patches and stuff for something like a Drupal 6. And I imagine that you'll probably be able to find vendors who are willing to, to work with you on a Drupal. Oh yeah, so. See what happens. Correct me, Brandon, if I'm wrong, but um, when we were in Austin um, three weeks ago, the, the head of Google, uh, Brie Luther, said, somebody asked him, if you had to start right now, what would you do? Google A or SAP? And, and he said, without any shadow of doubt, hesitation, he said, Google SAP, because it's probably going to be the most mature thing to do for about three years or so. I wouldn't say three years. It, Drupal 8 is probably going to come out in, within a year, and it's probably going to take Contrib about six months to a year to catch up. Um, and, and the other thing is, as, they, as these folks are working hard to get the three months because I'm more important on the speed of Drupal 8, also the new batch to move stuff at 7 to 8 will be a great module called Migrate, which is we used it to go from 6 to 7 in a really complex it is also a migraine sometimes, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yeah, could have been called migraine easily, but, uh, but, uh, but it's migraine. And, and uh, it's uh, Mike Ryan and uh, Chase, and, and I think it's called Quia, uh, Quia the Data. This is an awesome module that... Migrate's actually been around for a while. I, I used it on a project about two or three years ago when it first came out. And um, it, as much of a migraine as uh, doing migrations are, uh, I actually can't say enough good things about Migrate module. Like, it, it made it so much easier to do things because it makes it... The way that it's set up, you can do repeatable um, executions of import or like database exports and so you're basically bypassing Drupal altogether and you're just working with a raw database and so you're trying to convert like that database to whatever Drupal needs and so like there's like you it's very code based so it's not like you click a few things and it just happens but it's pretty straightforward like you know if you have the dev time to put into that like that's so much easier than trying to do like just like the regular GUI um, update and all that. And the upgrade process of the uh, migration process affords you the opportunity to examine what, what it is that you would like to change. Instead of doing just a straight upgrade, you would say, okay, let me think a little bit of what I got and what is that I want to prefer to the next version. So at the same time that you're upgrading, it gives you that opportunity to say, this is important, this content, this whole section in the last way. This thing could, you know, could use a little of the new advantages of the way. So I'm going to cast the content in this other way. And so to, to, for us, it was a great way to rethink how we were doing things in Drupal. And, and, and it, it just reduced that opportunity, right? And Migrate totally allowed us to do that. Well, if you were to use the straight upgrade from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, we would have ended up with the same stuff all the time, the same thing, right? Instead, which is fine, but we wouldn't Take that opportunity to like say, okay, let's do some improvements, not just the, the back end code base, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we only have a couple of minutes left, but I did want to kind of um, pass out a few resources. Uh, again, I'll, I'll have these slides online. There's actually a few extra goodies. Um, we'll consider them Easter eggs since we didn't get time, and we can talk about it later if you want. Um, so on the resources side of things, um, Here's a few things that I think would probably be really relevant for, um, you know, if you're wanting to do more mapping uh, stuff either in Drupal or outside and just kind of get a feel for like what the pulse is of this kind of community. Um, so Caroline Boyden did a, um, uh, a, a presentation called Intro to Maps at Bad Camp last year. And it was the best intro to like how you do mapping in Drupal that I've seen. And this is coming from someone who's given this kind of presentation for a very, very long time. So go watch this if you're interested in more of like a, like really, no, how do I actually walk through and build, build a map on this? Um, toward reusable charts, um, this is uh, an article written by uh, Mike Bostuck, who's the D3 guy that I was talking about earlier. Um, it's a really interesting kind of um, 
thought piece about like how how do you co like to kind of tie back into like the larger ESIP um, thought of you know trying to make sustainable software and that sort of thing. Uh, this is some thoughts towards like how do you um, you know how do you code things in a way that make it more useful for the long term versus doing just lots of one offs and that sort of thing. And so I have a slide earlier in here that again you know when, once I get the slides out um, that has a few different libraries that do that sort of thing for D three um, that you should check out. Uh, Cardo CSS reference, uh, so the styling language for the first two, the TileML and CardoDB. This is a great reference for that, just to kind of get a good sense of like what's cap what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, Mapbox actually does a really good job of giving lots of different examples of how you can build like interesting kinds of maps and that sort of thing. So they're definitely worth checking out. And then the last three are just some general news sources that I think are useful for just this kind of space. Uh, Slash Geo um, follows basically just like the open source and uh, Esri and Microsoft and all that follows like the comings and goings of them. Flowing Data is a really cool blog about um, um, data visualization, that sort of thing. And then the Data is Beautiful subreddit has uh, lots of really interesting examples and stuff um, that they kind of show um, pretty regularly. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so normally this is where I do Q&A, but we've been doing it through the entire thing, which is awesome. Um, I'll, I'll actually be around all day, um, so you know, I you know, can't wait to hear like what kinds of things you guys want to work on and that sort of thing. If you're interested in helping out, um, yeah, with um, from like an organization or a coding perspective on any of the Drupal stuff, you know, please let me know, um, and I can kind of get you hooked up with the right people and that sort of thing. Um, I'm pretty easy to find online in general, so you know, feel free to reach out. And uh, thank you for your time. So uh, it's 10.45 on the schedule. They've got coffee break for 15 minutes, so uh, hang out. We'll come back at 11 and, and talk more through what we can do this afternoon, uh, possibly for this P3 thing. So we encourage you to come back at 11. So uh, thanks for showing up. It's great. All right, so stop. Yeah.